So hello everyone, um, I'm Jean. I'm a learning technologist here at the Royal College of Art. I'm also a PhD student at Lancaster University. Why do I do a PhD? Don't ask that question. Don't even go there, thank you very much. And um, uh, so I'm going to talk about um, a research paper I wrote about 10 months ago, time my PhD to look at uh, whether or not we can build an intercultural student community using technology, particularly with blend and hybrid, the two trendy words that we've been saying for the last couple of years. And um, so um, I'll try not to talk at you, but um, being a PhD student, that's something I do very well. Uh, okay. So um, one thing we did very well in higher education, we cannot agree on simple definitions of things. So I'm going to tell you what my definitions are of blended and hybrid learning in this particular study that I did. So blended learning is the thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning experiences with online experiences. It's not the definition, but it's the definition I've chosen for this particular study. It's very important to emphasize that because you know we all have different interpretation of that and that's absolutely fine. Hybrid learning is what we're doing now in person and online um, simultaneously as a, uh, a live session. So these are the definitions that I've chosen to use for um, this study. And the um, theory, again, you can't have a research study without a bit of theory. So I'm gonna spend about 45 minutes talking about that. No, I won't, don't worry about it. Um, I'm not gonna to go too much into details about the community of inquiry framework because anyone you Google can do a better job than I do. I'm not going to waste your time on that. More importantly, um, this research study doesn't really use the entirety of the community inquiry framework, only use the one particular presence, um, which is the um, social, social presence, because it's about building an online community. So uh, whilst the other two types of presence are important, um, they're not the focus of this particular study. Okay, so the social presence includes things like engagement with each other between the students, um, kind of building a safe environment for the students to be able to express themselves freely. Because at the end of the day, for me, um, a community is about engage, encouraging students to um, kind of develop their critical voice and um, collaboration as well, which is something that we do very well in our design disciplines, particularly. Not specifically, but you know, uh, we do a lot of collaboration. We encourage that as well. So, um, and the intercultural aspect of it, because this is not just about student community, it's specifically about uh, intercultural community. Um, I've chosen to use the um, Hofstede cultural dimension. Um, Hofstede is was a Dutch sociology, I think. I think maybe. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> he came up with the, um, the two uh, phrases, individualism and collectivism. And um, individualism uh, represented I, which is commonly found in sort of Western society. Um, what do I want to do in my life? What is my life goal? How can you, as my teachers, as my peers, how can you help me to achieve my life goal? It's not about being selfish, it's just about being self-centered, it's very different, okay? Um, so it's, com it's quite common to find kids in school in the UK, for example, they're encouraged to speak up, which is quite a common thing, but as someone who come from Hong Kong, who come from a collectivist culture, it was always very alien for me because in the collectivist culture, it celebrates the we, what do we need to do as a group of people? How can I not make mistakes to embarrass my family? How can I contribute to my society? So very often you've found um, Asian students, even at university, they don't really speak very much. Um, this is the one example I use very often. When I did my MFA at Goldsmiths for three years, I barely spoke a word and I nearly failed on the basis that I didn't want to speak and it wasn't because I was stupid. It wasn't because I didn't know what was going on or anything like that. It was just because speaking in front of people like this was always a very daunting thing for me because of the cultural barrier. And it applies to a lot of people. 
And in my experience as uh, someone who's been working in Pekchi for many, many years, I kind of see this pattern, a lot of similarity with students. Um, they either who look like me, who don't really speak. And always, I understand why. And the more you force them, the more they are sort of not willing to speak. The pressure just makes them feel really embarrassed, okay? Um, so be interested, um, uh, have a read of some of his stuff. It's really, really um, fascinating. Uh, this is just a quick, um, just some random country that I, I, I pull out of, you know, thing there basically to kind of show you the individually some scores as you can see in China, it's probably, um, actually South Korea is the lowest, if, um, it's only 18. And then obviously um, in the UK and the US as people who have big ops, as you can see 89 and 91. So uh, <laughs> in the UK and the US, Canada, so the Western countries, people are encouraged to speak to kind of put themselves first. So it's quite a big contrast if you look at just, you know, China versus the UK. It's um, four and a bit times over. Um, so there is that. Um, so I'm gonna now gonna quickly um, share some of the foundings from my, my study. I'm gonna split it into two halves. First half is the um, opinion from the students so I'm going to tell you the facts, and then when we're talking about the findings from the staff, I'm going to turn it into a discussion because I don't want, I really don't want to talk to you for 45 minutes, so it's not in my nature. So um, it, like any, any research study, it's quite important to show the, it might not be of any interest to any of you here, but it's important for me to state the sample size so you know that in this particular instance, it isn't a big study, it is a small scale study, um, so it's not a representation of the masses, but it is a representation of some small voices um, that hopefully we can all learn from. So um, some of the key foundings from students, specifically with the blended learning experience um, in the last two or three years are as follows. Uh, 43 percent, so just, uh, just under half the student felt that there was an overall good experience with blended learning, developing a sense of community that was down to um, sort of support from staff, um, like the presentation before about, you know, creating sort of online communities, it helped. Um, um, but 56%, over half the students felt that remote learning has affected their peer engagement um, because they felt it was important to understand um, to know the peers background, particularly the cultural background. Um, but somehow engaging with each other through a screen is something that's kind of affecting that. But they have also acknowledged that the teacher tutors have helped, they have tried, but it's still something not really clicking. 39%, um, only 39% can I say are comfortable, were comfortable with intercultural interaction online. Um, despite the fact that they felt online collaboration should have helped um, increase their cultural awareness. Again, I think it's to do with, I remember one of the quotes I got from one of the students were like, um, there was no filter when people were talking online in the online Teams chat or Zoom chat, people tend to be more kind of, um, I wouldn't want to use the word braver, but they kind of, maybe less consideration would have gone into what they want to say, they just basically just tie whatever comes to their mind and can be quite upsetting to some people. Um, so it kind of, some people don't really feel comfortable with that. Um, and then there's a couple of quotes, a mixed race student in the UK, um, exactly what I said earlier, they felt the technology and behavioral barriers were not addressed, making the experience almost entirely negative. Um, there were comments about a lack of classroom management. Now. If I were teaching this class, I've been talking for about five minutes, you would come in really quietly at the back and just slipping through the back, you wouldn't interrupt. But on an, in an online classroom, people come and go as they please. People sometimes, you know, are stuffing, stuffing their faces with, with, with crisps and, and, and bowl of cereals. I'm, I've done it myself, I turn my camera off when I do that, but sometimes people forget. Those things um, weren't really managed according to some of the students, and this is just one example of one of the quotes. Um, this, this is why, just why the students said the technology and behavior barriers were not addressed. And, and it's something that you don't really see in a physical classroom. 
so people are more relaxed and sometimes I mean I've seen people turning up to work and not wearing a bathrobe with a towel around their head is that okay well I don't think it is but then what can you do about it right because you know it's, it's about respect I think another quote is um, a student from Hong Kong in the US is more positive he or she felt that they're more engaged uh, with other people and the learning because they are less intimidated by the thought of confrontation. So as I said earlier, the, the collectivist behavior, it's very hard to speak in front of people like what I'm doing now. This gap has taken years to develop. So <laughs> allowing them the, the, the opportunity to speak behind a screen, to literally hide behind a screen helps because they're not really talking to the people, they're talking to an object. That's how they sort of see it. And with particularly with asynchronous sort of communication typing messages, you can, you can rehearse, you can type, you can delete, you can type, you can delete to a point where you're happy with your message. So it's far less immediate and it helps people from the kind of more collectivist culture or cultures. Um, so I'm gonna now move on to some of the key findings from hybrid learning. Now, just as I said earlier, it's not the same as blended. Hybrid learning is what we're doing now purely synchronous as uh, yeah, sorry synchronous sessions that happens both uh, with people attending online and people attending uh, in in a classroom uh 43 percent of the people felt that it, it was hard to engage with their classmates from other cultures when they're not, they're not all online or on campus now i have to say i think i personally found it hard to engage full stop because as you can see today, it's actually a, an example of how, you know, when we just had a break, it was very hard for the online colleagues to communicate with us in person because it doesn't really quite work. Um, and if you throw the cultures into the mix, then it's even harder. Um, so there is that. And then 56% um, of the people felt it's created a two-tier system. The two-tier is, that's the online trip, and that's the in the classroom trip. There's a brick wall between us. Uh, because you think if you cast your mind back to the last two years, um, even though students might have been given a choice to attend in person on, in a classroom and online, very often it's because of um, COVID, because of family situation, because you know they are 2,000 miles away, they can't physically come um, on campus. So, so even though they were given a choice. They weren't really given a choice. They can eat the, they, they just had to do things online. So the two tier system um, was a problem for, for some of them. And uh, only 39% of students felt that the tutors have continued with blended learning activities. And that's, as a learning technologist for me, that was not surprising at all, but it was also quite upsetting because we had a good time doing blended learning. We did a lot of things, putting loads of activities on our VLE. We created loads of online spaces. We, 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 we spent a lot of time designing a lot of really interesting asynchronous activities to kind of bridge the gap as it were. But as soon as we say, guys, you can go on campus, have a big screen, talk to your student online if they can't attend, those blended learning activities just seem to have disappeared overnight. Now, um, it's not a reflection of any of our institutions. This is just the foundings from the studies. I did not ask the students um, any particular institution. Those information were not disclosed because I suppose in a way I didn't want to know, you know. So that was that. And then there's a couple of quotes. Uh, sorry, one more. 72% um, of the students felt that it's so easy to ignore the classmate online when they can interrupt each other. Just think about it, you don't have to tell me. Would you rather I talk to someone who's sitting next to you or would you rather go onto a computer and talk to someone online? I know what I would choose as a, as a human being. That's just our instinct. So I guess the question for us to kind of think about is what can we do to kind of, you know, sort of bridge the gap? I don't have an answer, but um, there we go. Um, just a couple of quotes and then we'll move on to um, discussion. An African student in the UK said that we cannot change people, students and or shooters who will ignore international students would do so either in person or online, feeling excluded even before the pandemic was common. Now the matter is worse. When I, when I was doing my um, data analysis and I saw this quote, I, 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 was, I was really heartbroken because they were right. 
you know, institutional racism exist. And with the pandemic, it kind of, it kind of made it worse in some honors in the world. I'm not saying again, you know, it's no reflection on any of our institutions at all, but it exists because if you don't like a student of a particular demographic in a classroom, they keep waving their hand, keep, you know, you can't ignore them because it's your job. You just shut them online. Just ignore them, pretend, just pretend you don't see their messages. You can, there's so much you can, so much more you can do to ignore them if you wanted to. So, you know, it, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to leave it there because it's, uh, it's another kind of um, interest of mine, research interest of mine. Um, mixed race students in the UK have said the majority of the interaction has been despite the staff rather than through the facilitation. So it kind of goes back to one of the foundings earlier. Only 39% of the students have said blended learning activities have continued as since the governments across the world have said, you can now go back into the office and you can now go back on campus. It's kind of feel like all the hard work that went into making things making to blended learning works, people just go like, you know what, doesn't matter, we'll just, just go back to go back to how it was. Uh, really, really good friend of mine, um, Dr. Alexandra Miha, she um, said to me that, that, that blended learning is like a life jacket, that we only needed it when, you know, excuse my language, and shit was hitting the fat. Now, things are back to normal, as normal as it can be. We don't need the life jacket anymore, we can just throw it away. Well, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. But um, that is the, the, the reality um, of it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop talking at you. Uh, I've turned the foundings from the college, the five colleagues I interviewed, to talk about to, to explore their experience with kind of facilitating, supporting, building intercultural communities for the students. And I've turned the foundings into some key questions. And I want us to have a discussion. If you don't want to talk, that's absolutely fine. That's a Padlet board there. If you want to um, contribute there, if you, you know, it's entirely up to you. Um, so I'm going to just um, lower the questions up. But once, um, so the first question, are we simply connecting students or building a community? Do we even know the difference between connecting a bunch of students who just happen to be doing the same course and putting it with each other? Or are we helping them to build a community? Do we know what they actually want? Do we understand what a community is? Do students, and I mean all the students, do they, do every single one of them really care about being part of a community? On a um, fashion program, for example, you can easily have up to 80 students per year. Does every single one of them want to get on with each other? Or do they just want to come here, get a degree, and go to something else? Are we enforcing the ideology of, of community building onto our students? Um, and um, the last question is obviously, assuming they want to be a part of the community, uh, one of my colleagues in, uh, who worked in the UK for many, many years, a technical manager, to moved to Canada, he said, have we even considered enough the technical barriers students face? So very well and good to say, you know, we have got this blended learning activity, we've got hybrid, we've got all these things. Have we just stopped for a moment and thought about how many students who are living below the poverty line, how many students do not have a computer? How many students do not have stable internet access? Because with all the things we are doing, with those stable internet, internet connection, what's left? Um, I remember he said to me, um, um, it's quite upsetting, uh, he said to me, some of the students um, from India who, when COVID hit, um, they couldn't afford to go home, so they got stuck in Canada. And every day they had to try, travel up to 50 miles to an internet cafe so then they can carry on with their learning. So it was kind of like, you know, they can't go home. They had to travel 50 miles in, every day to go somewhere to get stable internet so they can go online and listen to a tutor talking at them. But, you know... I don't think we can solve the technical barriers problem because it's way bigger than us. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll stop talking. I just wanted to open up to the floor. Um, so any thoughts on this um, questions? I might need someone to help me with the online bit. <clears throat> any kind of comments in?
quiet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to referring to the first presentation by Sunday, uh, digging down to the idea of a learning community. I thought that was quite a relevant point rather than saying, oh, it's a community, you know, for the sake of it to be made, but it's a community that will support you in this particular activity, which is learning. Um, then you know, that makes sense to me in terms of students would be interested in a, in a community for learning rather than just a community in a sort of broad sweep. Yeah. Anyone wants to say anything? Or do I have to sort of... Kate? Thank you, you said that was so interesting. I'm going to go and read all your papers. Um, after that, it was really interesting, especially the, the framework that was within. But I, I noticed some similarities between your presentations. And I don't know if it's just me, and you can challenge me if I'm wrong, but picking out that actually synchronicity is, is a big barrier to community these days. And I think it will be continue to be a bigger barrier as we face things like energy crisis. For example, I have a lot of students in South Africa. Most of my team are in South Africa, and they're in the highest level of load shedding at the moment, which is nine hours a day without electricity. They, they can't come together to learn. It's got to be asynchronous. And I think we continue to focus on real time as being the best form of teaching. I've seen fully asynchronous courses that have had really high student outcomes, so students being really engaged, have brilliant feedback. I'd love us to put more effort into looking at what makes a really rich asynchronous activity, because that kind of supports a, an unknown future that we're all going into, you know, pandemics, energy crisis, all that kind of thing. And people need to learn no matter what's happening in the world. But that's just an observation that I've pulled from. Yeah. I think I think asynchronous learning, you know, it doesn't really come natural for a lot of students because, you know, in, in, in school we, we, we're used to kind of, you know, attending and playing with your mates and, and, and listening to, to, to your teachers standing in front of the class. But 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 you know, asynchronous learning for me personally, it, it works really well because I can, you know, I've got a full-time job, I study whenever I can. And and, and as I said earlier, in terms of the cultural barrier. It really just means that I can I can rehearse and reshape my messages and how I kind of want to phrase what I want to say before I say it, rather than in, in, in a synchronous discussion. As I said, going back to my MFA experience, every single week, every Friday morning, you sit around in a room in a corner. It's like one of those group therapy sort of sort of setting, literally around a corner, you know, around it, around a circle, and everybody takes turn to present. It didn't really work worked for me. It works for some people. It likes to talk and show off the work that doesn't work for everyone. And, and, and that's why that's, that's a really good example I always use. If I were given the opportunity to, to, to contribute to those really interesting discussions asynchronously, I think I would have done a lot better. Uh, I, I think my experience probably applied to a lot of students. It doesn't have to be a cultural thing. It could be an ability, uh, neural diversity, or just simple preference you know um yeah anyway i, I i'm with you so I'm, I'm trying to say um yeah and uh Jorge has put something online saying uh, collaboration is more complex than acquisition how much longer does community building take online what skills does it require from students and from academics i think that that kind of crosses over with the with the comment about the move to asynchronicity yeah, I think it's, it's more it's more resource intense, isn't it? Asynchronous, you know, with, with synchronous learning or teaching. If you've been if you've taught the same class a couple of times, you just rock up and you talk. Uh, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's, it's again, it comes more naturally. I remember uh, one of the academics I worked with in my previous job, uh, as she said to me, um, she was, she wasn't really anxious about the technology. She's really you know embracing it, but she was really concerned about not having the kind of control of a classroom. She didn't know what to do. Like she can't, uh, it was a graphic design lecturer. She couldn't walk around a studio and just talk to the student and make sure they're all right. So th there's a lot of, um, I suppose, changing of the mindset because the kind of walking around a studio and using the air quotation mark, you can do it virtually. It just takes more time and I understand the academics, you know, all of us in this room, we're under time pressure, we you know we overwork and all that, but I think it's 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 a 
I, I don't know. It's, it's it can be done, but it will it will you know. Um, I was um, I was talking to um, uh, Don Pace from City um, a while back, and he was saying you know. Uh, seems the, the analogy he used was that before the pandemic, very few people knew how to swim and what was happening. Everybody learned how to swim. Why do we stop swimming now? We can you know, we've learned how to swim. If we can carry on, you know, we survive. We're not drowned yet. So why can't we sort of just carry on? I, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes left. This is meant to be a discussion. It's not meant to be me talking. Yes, we can share the we can share the slide. It's not a problem. Uh, yeah, if you, anybody have any other thoughts, um, feel free to um, contribute to the to the online discussion um, asynchronously. Um, I think there there were a few comments on there before anyway, um, but yeah.